Wait a second, wait a second. You, you're reporting uh, based on sources that heard this from Mohammed bin Salman, that he has been boasting that the president's son-in-law gave him U.S. intelligence about who his own internal enemies are? The prince is saying, I have Kushner in my pocket because... The Intercept's reporting was that Jared's dad, Charles Kushner, had again asked for a big Qatari investment, and The Intercept reported that the Qataris again said no. Maybe the reason the U.S. government took this radical and sudden unexplained turn against Qatar is because Qatar wouldn't give Jared's family any money. Let's start this tale in 2005. So that year, Charles Kushner is under investigation by federal prosecutors for tax evasion and questionable election contributions. During that time, a member of his family is cooperating with prosecutors against him. So he gets the idea to hire a sex worker, film the sex worker doing her business with the relative, then use that videotape against his family member to blackmail him into no longer cooperating with, with prosecutors. As you can imagine with a Coen Brothers like scheme like this, it all collapsed and they caught him doing that. And so not only was he convicted of tax evasion and improper financial contributions to politicians, but they also tacked on tampering with a witness, intimidating a witness charge. So he got hit with that extra felony as well. So he goes to prison in 2000. Five. Because he goes to prison, Jared Kushner takes over Kushner companies. At the time, he's something like 25, 26 years old. And he's brash. He's ready to make his mark. He's, he's arriving on the Manhattan scene. He's overseeing this billion-dollar real estate company. He decides he's going to sell all of these properties that they have in New Jersey that they're renting out to tenants and use the money from that and dump it into a building at 666 Fifth Avenue which at the time uh, was selling or he was willing to pay $1.8 billion for. So he sinks basically much of the, the family's fortune into this property, $500 million cash, and then they borrow the rest. He did this in 2007 when people who weren't even involved with real estate could see that the real estate crash was coming. The property becomes badly underwater. And so the family is then searching around the globe for refinancing uh, schemes. In 2011, they managed to sell off almost half the building to stave off foreclosure, but they have a balloon payment due in February 2019. And so they've been, hunt they've been hunting for billions since then to try and uh, shore up this property because in real estate, everything is cross collateralized. And if a big thing goes down, everything else is problematic. That brings us to when Jared Kushner is trying to work the Gulf region, because if you need this kind of money, you're, you're either getting it from the Russians, you're getting it from the Chinese, or you're getting it from the Gulf. There might be some other outliers in Malaysia or Latvia, but in general, uh, those are your three big pools of capital. And so Kushner continues pressing hard on Qatar, which is this kind of gas-rich peninsula right in the Persian Gulf. And they get very close to a $500 million deal with Hamid bin Jassim Al Thani, who is a former prime minister of Qatar and one of, if not the richest person uh, in, in the country, that deal fell through. Tom Barak, good friend of Charles Kushner and Donald Trump, has since told the Washington Post that they were that the Kushners were crushed when that deal fell through. Just weeks later, Jared Kushner plays a pivotal role in uh, supporting a blockade of Qatar by Saudi Arabia and the UAE and some allied countries. The nation of Qatar, unfortunately, has historically been a funder of terrorism at a very high level. And in the wake of that conference, nations came together and spoke to me about confronting Qatar over its behavior. All right, there's the Qatar blockade. Trump and Kushner took a side against American foreign policy interests because a loan was not forthcoming for a half a... That's the suggestion, yeah. All right, and then there's this warring royal family in Saudi Arabia, and Trump and Kushner have taken a side, including possibly sharing United States intelligence in the president's daily brief about who your enemies are, who you can round up, and they've taken a side because why? Well... We don't, we don't know why, but uh, one of the sources of financing for um, 666 Fifth Avenue certainly would be Saudi Arabia. The prince is saying, I have Kushner in my pocket because... 
Yeah, his evidence is that, you know, when I met with him in late October of this year, uh, he brought me the names of political dissidents within the royal family and other elites in, in Saudi society that U.S. intelligence had collected and determined were kind of skeptical of the crown prince's rapid rise. A week later uh, is when this famous kind of Ritz Royal Roundup happened, where, you know, they, they turned the Ritz Carlton Riyadh into a, into a prison. Kushner makes an unannounced trip to Riyadh. So this is, this is late October. It, it catches a lot of intelligence officials off guard. News didn't leak out about the trip until he had almost returned from it. We learned afterwards that Kushner spent several evenings staying up till 4 a.m. talking strategy and politics with Mohammed bin Salman, who is the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who, who only became crown prince in June when he ousted uh, his cousin, Mohammed bin Nayef, who had, who had been next in line. A week later, Mohammed bin Salman launches a crackdown. Uh, he rounds up dozens of royal family members and other elites. It extended eventually into hundreds. Uh, he, he imprisoned many of them in the Ritz-Carlton, converting it into a luxury prison. Some of them were tortured. At least one of them was uh, tortured to death, we now know. What we've been able to report now is that Following his meeting with Kushner, MBS told his confidants, including Mohammed bin Zayed, who is the crown prince of Abu Dhabi and the effective leader of the UAE, he told him that Kushner had given him the names of some Saudis that were disloyal to him and said that Kushner was in his pocket. We were not in this meeting, of course, so we don't know exactly what happened, but independently we can confirm that there were intelligence reports that included names like this, and that Kushner had access to these names, and that Kushner showed an extra level of engagement when the intelligence briefings that he was in were around the subject of politics in the Gulf region. Uh, Yusuf Oteba, I first heard about it from, in your reporting about sex trafficking. You also reported in that article that he's a buddy of Jared Kushner's. And also, can you weave in Rex Tillerson to this story? So Yeah, so Tom Barak, who we mentioned earlier, connected Oteba and and Kushner, because uh, the UAE didn't, just like everyone else on the planet, did not expect Trump to win. And so w when he did, they were caught a little bit flat-footed. They've lucked out in the sense that Oteba and Mike Pompeo have been very close for a long time, and so they're going to be just fine. But as they initially started out, Oteba, uh, and, to Oteba and Kushner became very close, and Kushner would go to Oteba to ask him to explain um, you know, the Middle East, and so he would tutor him. Oteba, the UAE and Saudi Arabia have very much hated Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson, when the blockade was announced by Saudi Arabia and UAE in June, immediately tried to negotiate a way out of it. The United States has a huge uh, military presence in Qatar. It's a staging ground for the projection of all sorts of power around, around the region. And uh, there are commercial interests, there's defense interests. It, on and on. It was not in the United States' interest for there to be a crisis among these Gulf countries. Immediately after Tillerson called for a negotiated end to this and called for an end to the blockade, Trump put out a statement and went to uh, Twitter to say, well, Qatar is just a, a bunch of terrorists and they fund terrorism. And so, uh, you know, go get them. And so it, it later turned out that it was Jared Kushner acting on behalf of Oteba or taking a statement from Oteba you know, who had instigated that about face. Recently, there's been more reporting, and I have sources that, that confirm this, that uh, Mohammed bin Zayed and bin Salman are, are both bragging that they were able to get Tillerson fired. Uh, they, now, I think that it's a little more complicated than that. Trump, you might remember, fired him shortly after the statement that he gave on, on Russia, though it's he may have actually already been fired before that, which helped him have the confidence to make a statement like that, but absolutely the influence uh, that had been injected by these Gulf countries colored Trump's perception of Tillerson, and you know he understood that he would be doing his friends over there a favor if he got rid of them. We have a question about the status of the royal family members that were arrested. Uh, they've all been released. A lot of them are on house arrest, can't you know, um, and a lot of them, um, you know, cut deals uh, in order to get their freedom. Um, and, and these are many of these people, by the way, are pieces of work themselves. These are people who were indeed, um, you know, stealing from uh, stealing from the 
Saudi government. I mean, they were the Saudi government. It was, it was, you know, it was just kind of uh, a way of doing business there. That that if you ran a private company that was funded by the government, you skimmed a huge portion off the top. That that absolutely happened. And uh, Mohammed bin Salman would be correct that you would uh, that you would want to end that practice. A lot of these stories were first reported by you and The Intercept, and only now, for instance, is Charles Kushner, Jared's dad, admitting that it's true that he met with the... Right, this is a good one. So, yeah, so we reported early March, March 2nd, that the April prior, Charles Kushner had met uh, with the Qataris and hit them up for cash. Just earlier this week, he finally gave a statement uh, to the Washington Post saying, yes, it's true that I met with them, but we weren't going to take their money. That would be wrong. I would not... It would, it would, it would look bad. Uh, that, that's an... That's an ethical transgression that I could never abide. This is a man who hired a prostitute in order to set up a family member to try to get himself out of a fraud prosecution and got caught for it and wound up going to prison just a few years ago. Uh, but maybe he has been rehabilitated and has found a new sense of, uh, of ethics. But it doesn't explain why he would go to the meeting. You know, in, in the business world, there's very much, you know, much can be much, much can be gleaned from where a meeting was held, uh, and and what the power dynamic is. So the fact that the Cutteries were staying at the St. Regis Hotel and Kushner came to them undermines his argument that he was just it was just a courtesy meeting, and if they would have offered money, he would have said, "Oh, please, 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 no, put that money away here. My my son is uh, in the White House. That would be horrible if I took this foreign money from you." So. A, he went to them. B, why the follow-up meeting? Why meet the next day? Did you need two courtesy meetings to tell them that you won't take the money? That part of it never made sense. Okay, so Sarah Talbot was bringing up the security clearance. So you reported that, it's actually your first paragraph, that while he still had security clearance, which is up until very recently, and in right. this story, it's during the time right. when the administration was choosing sides, he was a voracious reader of the PDB. I think that's the most important part, that United States intelligence is being used to take sides in this royal family battle. Right. If, if, if it's true, we, you know, we weren't in the meeting, we don't know what Kushner actually did, but, uh, but yes, so the, Mohammed bin Salman's claim to his confidants is that Kushner uh, shared with him this intelligence, intelligence he would have been able to glean from, from these briefings. That's right. He, so Kushner only had a handful of names, of the dozens that were arrested would have been from the result of this if if that's what if that's what actually happened. Secondly, he probably knew already who he was going to round up. I think it just kind of helps him politically to be able to say this guy's in my pocket. Look, uh, you know, you're trying to go up against me. You're going up against me and the White House. The White House helped me with this. Do you see that uh, that chain around the, the gold necklace around? Uh... President Trump's uh, neck there. Well, Saudi King Salman presented that to the president. It's a gold medal. And here's, here's something else to look at. When Trump went there in May, there is an exception uh, to the public uh, gift rule. Uh, if, you get, if you're a public servant, you get a gift that costs more than like $50 or so. You have to give it back to the government, and the government keeps it, um, puts it in a museum, sells it, whatever they do with it. There is one exception, and that's awards and medals. So if you get a medal for being the greatest Saudi Arabian supporter in the world, you can keep that medal. If these are diamonds, that could be worth millions of dollars if it's... Is it just an ego boost or a bribe? If it's studded with diamonds. Yeah. Wow. What do you think? Well, it works both ways for Trump. <laughs> you know, make him feel good about himself. It, it's been reported, I think, in the, in the Times recently that... There's a new uh, Mueller witness who's been granted immunity. And his story is, is that the Saudis have been funneling money to Trump political organizations. Right. And so this has been going on, uh, and this is what we've been talking about uh, for, I've been writing about for years, and we've been talking about here uh, for a long time. And o Oteba was the one who kind of facilitated this for the UAE, that, he, that, that it funnels a lot of money into Washington in order to influence our, our foreign policy thinking. In this case, uh, it was running th to a counter channel through uh, this guy, George Nader, to this other guy, Elliot Broidy, who uh, then pumped it into think tanks. And the think tanks held kind of anti-cutter conferences where 
academics and policymakers would get up and give their presentations about what's wrong with what's wrong with Qatar. And we, and we reported on these at the time because they appeared to be funded by the UAE. And we asked them, are you getting money from the UAE for these? And, and they told us very specifically, we, we do not take foreign money on principle. Uh, so no, absolutely not. So now we know that uh, it depends on what your definition is of foreign money. It was foreign money, then it was given to Broidy, and then Broidy gave it to them. Does it mean it's not foreign money anymore because you had a middleman that passed it on? I think that's something that they're going to have to answer for in the wake of this article. But there's more reporting to be and investigation to be done on that. Yeah. Mueller's going to get to the bottom of it because he we'll has see. this guy Nader yeah. singing. Although Nader's back in the UAE. Didn't they call him back? You can call somebody back. Does that mean they're going to come back? Would you, oh. would you come back? And he's got immunity, so... He's, been, he's gone to uh, prison twice for pedophilia. Oh, my God, really? If I were him, I probably would not come back. The but. finest people. We just, we just have the people. finest... <laughs> the best. The best people.